Hello, everyone, and welcome to this edition of the 5 Minutes Sarcoma Talk on Onco Daily. Uh, I'm back with you as your host, Shushan Hovsepian, and today I'm thrilled to be joined by an expert in the field of sarcoma, Dr. Vinayak Venkatraman. Uh, Dr. Venkatraman is a medical oncologist uh, working at Dana Farber Cancer Institute, where he works in the Sarcoma Center. Uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Venkatraman, for joining us, and hello. Uh, hello, thanks so much for uh, for having me. I'm really excited to talk with you. Thank you. Uh, so let's start by exploring the unique nature of liposarcomas in adults. We know that uh, they are uh, rare tumors representing a small percentage of all cancers. Uh, could you please tell us more about what makes liposarcoma particularly unique compared to other malignancies? Sure, yes. So uh, as you in the audience probably know, sarcomas are very rare. Um, they affect less than 1% of all adults. Um, they're basically a group of different cancers that connect your body together and give you give you form and function. And um, among those less than 1%, uh, liposarcomas in adults are probably the most common that we see, roughly about 20%. Um, you know, I think that what makes them really unique is that there are various different subtypes of liposarcoma, and each of those subtypes is very biologically and clinically distinct. Um, you know, we'll probably spend the most time talking about the most common subtype, uh, which is called uh, well-differentiated uh, liposarcoma and de-differentiated liposarcoma. They're sort of cousins of each other. They um, have similar biology. They're both characterized by high levels of a, a couple proteins, MDM2 and CDK4. Um, however, by, uh, clinically, they behave in, in slightly different ways, uh, well-differentiated being more like an indolent, almost benign Tumor uh, de-differentiated being slightly uh, more aggressive, more like a high-grade sarcoma. Um, and you can actually have tumors that have components of both uh, within them. Um, uh, more rare subtypes that are also um, uh, biologically distinct, uh, one is called mixoid uh, round cell liposarcoma. That's characterized by um, a specific chromosomal translocation, so similar to other types of sarcoma in that um, regard. Uh, it's the DDIT3 uh, FUS or TLS are the most common. Um, and those ones are uh, tend to be a little bit more aggressive. Um, I see them in younger patients, uh, typically soft tissue. Um, they like to spread to uh, the spine and bone marrow, so it makes them unique um, and managed very, very differently than the first subtype. And then finally, the, the most uncommon subtype is pleomorphic liposarcoma. We won't probably spend as much time on them. It resembles more high-grade uh, sarcomas like UPS, and so we manage them in that sort of way. But yeah, all three are very uh, distinct and, and sort of managed differently. And I'm uh, looking forward to talking more about that. Uh, thank you very much for breaking down the as unique aspects of liposarcomas, especially the distinct biological subtypes. And uh, building on that, uh, given the uniqueness, given the rarity, uh, I imagine that there are a lot of uh, um, challenges that come with it. So what are some of the most significant challenges you face in managing liposarcoma cases and how these challenges influence your approach to both early diagnosis and long-term management? Yeah, so I think the, the biggest um, challenge with liposarcoma, um, similar to other types of sarcoma, is that um, even if you find it in one place and you do everything you can uh, to remove it in that one place, there still is a high chance of it coming back both either in the same place or a local recurrence or at another site, uh, typically the lungs, um, uh, which you call a distant recurrence. And so a lot of the efforts in terms of how we improve our treatment is how do we, for localized disease, reduce the risk uh, of it of coming back either in the same place or in other parts of your body. Um, for metastatic disease, uh, the challenge is really finding biologically informed uh, treatments to better control the disease in a way that gets us away from chemotherapy, which is traditionally what we first or most commonly use, and trying to find ways that we can target the biology either with targeted treatments or use uh, the immune system uh, to our advantage to, to fight the cancer. And so I'd say the biggest challenge in the metastatic disease is just that our current armament of tools, uh, they work, but they sort of don't work as well as we'd like, and they're not really sustained in their durability. And so if we can find ways to, to better treat them um, going forward, I think that's that's the, the greatest challenge yeah. and opportunity. The challenges you have highlighted, particularly regarding the recurrence, the difficulty in treating metastatic disease, emphasize the complexity of management. 
So uh, to continue on that, let's discuss also the treatment. It is, of course, a critical aspect. And uh, could you elaborate more on the current standard treatment options for liposarcomas? Yeah, so liposarcomas, um, because they're rare, they're best treated in a multidisciplinary sarcoma center with specialized radiologists, surgeons, and medical oncologists um, taking care of, of the patients. And for localized disease, um, we'll focus mostly, I think, on D-diff and well-diff liposarcoma. Um, you know, for well-differentiated liposarcoma, the standard of care is, is trying to do the minimum, the maximal tumor reduction with the minimum harm, because we know if all of the tumor is well-diff, then the chance of it coming back is fairly low. And if it comes back, it typically comes back in the same place. And we actually call well-differentiated liposarcomas in the limbs, uh, atypical lipomatous tumors or ALT. And in those cases, unlike other sarcomas, we actually will do a marginal excision rather than a radical excision uh, because we want to preserve as much limb as we can, knowing that the chance of it coming back uh, is relatively low. For dedifferentiated liposarcoma, the standard of care really is the use of radiation either before and after surgery because we know that if all we did was surgery, there's a high chance um, for those higher grade tumors of it coming back uh, in the limbs. And so you can either do radiation before or after. Uh, they sort of have different pros and cons. Same outcomes, but we uh, at Dana-Farber, we typically do preoperative radiation because it's a lower dose um, and a lower uh, amount of field of treatment. Um, we acknowledge that there's a higher risk of wound complications after surgery, but um, we think that the lower dose is better in the long run. Um, in the abdomen, uh, it's a little bit more complicated. Uh, there was a large trial stress that looked at uh, using preoperative radiation for retroperitoneal uh, sarcomas, including liposarcomas, and there wasn't a benefit seen. So we commonly don't um, use that in our practice. Um, the use of systemic treatments uh, in localized disease is controversial, and it sort of depends on the provider and the patient and the risk of recurrence, uh, whether or not that's used. Um, to that point, we are participating in Strauss II, which is looking at the use of new adjuvant um, chemotherapy for localized receptible liposarcomas in the retroperitoneum and to see if, if that can reduce the chance of distant recurrence. But I'd say them in by and large for well diff and D-diff, uh, if it's in the limbs, D-diff, uh, you do radiation and surgery. Um, and if it's in the abdomen, you typically do a surgical resection followed by surveillance. Uh, mixoid liposarcoma and pleomorphic, we don't talk as much about. They're sort of more managed, uh, similar to D-differential liposarcoma if they're localized. Um, and then for metastatic disease, uh, similar. Um, for all of them, we, you know, our first line agents are chemotherapy, but for dedifferentiated liposarcoma, we're starting to be able to use off-label targeted therapies like CDK4 inhibitors, as well as immune therapies are, are also something that we've seen some response in. So those are being used in the metastatic setting. Yeah, thanks a lot uh, for sharing that. And uh, of course, standard of care is... Uh, um, um, is the first choice, but sometimes it's not enough. And uh, what are the recent advancements in uh, any new breakthrough therapies in liposarcomas that you uh, find particularly promising? Yeah, yeah. So um, for localized uh, deep differentiated liposarcoma, um, actually this past uh, ASCO uh, 2024, there was a, a major abstract that was presented looking at, you know, in addition to preoperative radiation and surgery for these extremity um, or abdominal wall um, liposarcomas, can we use pembrolizumab in the preoperative setting um, concurrently and synergistically with radiation and then also after surgery to improve our outcomes? Um, so the study, uh, which we were a participating study, um, did show that in this phase two trial, there was a benefit in terms of disease-free survival for high-grade uh, tumors specifically. Um, it's still uh, in, you know, premature for overall survival. So that's what we're waiting on in terms of longer uh, follow-up um, and also uh, larger clinical trials, such as a phase three trial. But I think that's the most exciting thing in localized liposarcoma at present. And then for metastatic disease, um, you know, I'd say it's in the realm of trying to improve how our targeted approach to the underlying biology of the tumor, as well as, um, you know, trying to see if we can use the immune system to our advantage. And so, um, for D-differentiated liposarcoma, you know, we have trials looking at, you know, for example, is abemocyclib a better agent than palbocyclib? Um, so we have a trial of abema versus placebo and, and seeing if we can add that to our toolkit. That's exciting to us. It's a national trial. Um, another one is, is looking at um, palbocyclib compared to palbocyclib uh, plus simiplomab, so an immune therapy, 
to see if the um, there's some synergy that we can see by using both a targeted therapy and an immunotherapy um, for metastatic disease. And then um, we do have a, a couple uh, newer agents that we're testing in liposarcoma. One is a DNA PK inhibitor, peposertib, with low dose doxyl, um, and then another one is called uh, PTX51. And um, so both of those are, and that's a, a CK1A um, and CDK79 inhibitor. And so basically, are there better ways that we can target the underlying biology? And I think the most exciting thing for us is really an international um, collaboration. Um, Data Farber runs the David Liposarcoma Research Initiative, which brings together scientists from across the country and world to really see if can we under can we understand the underlying biology of liposarcoma in a way that allows us to improve our targeting um, of the underlying disease. And then finally, I'll just end with mixoid liposarcoma. Um, you know, there's been a lot of excitement in synovial sarcoma um, because of uh, an engineered T-cell product that uh, targets MAJ4 uh, hyperexpressed in synovial sarcoma. And we know that mixoid liposarcoma are also um, do have a hyperexpression of MAJ4 um, and NYESO1 uh, which are two tensor cancer testes antigens. And so there's a lot of interest in, can we see um, the same response we saw in synovial sarcoma, can we see it in mixoid liposarcoma, both for engineered T-cell products as well as uh, by specific T-cell engagers. So that's all very exciting to us in the field. Yeah, thank you so much for the comprehensive overview. It, it was very helpful. And uh, even though the tumors are very rare and challenging, it is very exciting to see that a lot of research is ongoing. And um, I would like to uh, go uh, change the subject a little bit. And before we wrap up, I would love to hear about your personal journey. What inspired you to specialize in sarcomas in this uh, challenging and unique field? Yeah, yeah. So, I'm, uh, you know, depending on how far you want to go back, uh, you know, I didn't, you know, for example, I didn't go to college thinking I'd be a doctor. Uh, I was actually an, an electrical engineer. And um, I did a, an internship in, in um, at Bausch & Loom in, in my hometown of Rochester, New York. And that sort of opened my eyes to the idea of, can you um, solve problems and challenges for people in a more actionable way and sort of leverage the ideas of engineering and, and technology to do that? And so that's really um, the initial inspiration for medicine as a field. And then I sort of like popped around, popped around to different types, different fields within medicine. I thought, you know, I'd be a, a neurologist or cardiologist. I did some work in telemedicine with Parkinson's disease. Um, and then in medical school is when I really uh, realized that actually, you know, I thought I'd only want to take care of adults, but I actually really loved taking care of kids um, and found a lot of meaning in taking care of kids with cancer specifically. Um, you know, but I, there was a sort of an age group that I really resonated the most with, which were young adults, um, so teenagers and young adults. And so that led me to train in, in medpeds since I'm, you know, in, both an internist and pediatrician, but really with a focus and interest in young adults, um, you know, facing uh, chronic illness. But then it was only in residency that I realized that oncology was was the sort of application of the, the population of need was young adults with cancer was the one that I really wanted to focus my life, my life's work in. And it's been really rewarding and meaningful to, to support young adults through their journey and, and understanding that, you um, you know, taking the tenants, um, of, you know, pediatrics, where we think about the whole person and whole body and, you know, the emotional, social and economic needs of our patients and their families, um, bringing that approach to adult medicine has been really rewarding. And, and that's how we try to approach the care of young adults is it's sort of not just uh, their disease, but also all the things in their life that are gone awry by their cancer diagnosis and how best we can support them to help them thrive. Yeah, completely agree. Uh, th that was very interesting. And thank you for sharing your insights uh, on liposarcoma today and also your personal journey. It's clear that while there are challenges in managing these rare cancers, there are also incredible progress being made in research and treatment. So thanks a lot for joining us. Stay tuned and stay healthy until our next episode. Thank you. Thanks so much. Great to chat. Don't forget to like, comment, share, and subscribe to Onka Daily on YouTube. Hit the bell icon to stay updated.